So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Joanna Kerr and I'm a librarian with London Public Library. I'll be your moderator for today. And I also have Kinga Colton behind the scenes helping out who can give a wave. Um, and a warm welcome to our guests, Tasnia Rahman, Danny Bartlett and Matthew Sereda, who we'll meet very soon. Hello to everyone. So the theme for International Women's Day this year is Break the Bias, which invites us to imagine a gender equal world, a world free of bias, stereotypes, and discrimination, a world that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive, a world where difference is valued and celebrated. Today's theme of menstrual rights invites us to do just this. And we'll share the link in the chat so you can learn more about today's uh, theme or this year's theme. So just to note, live transcript is available today. If you'd like to see closed captions during our program, to enable them, click on the box in your Zoom screen, normally located at the bottom of, of that Zoom screen. And it has the letters CC for closed captioning on it. There are limitations to this service. It's affected by volume and background noise uh, and full captions will be available with the recording of the program, which we'll make available on the library's YouTube channel. And we'll just include, yeah, thanks uh, Kinga in the chat that as well. So I'm just going to get our slides going here. I'm just gonna share the screen. Uh, stand by, this always takes me a bit of a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so, oh. Oh dear, thanks for your patience with this. So we're going to start um, with uh, our land acknowledgement today. Just going to just change some things here. So I'd like to start today by acknowledging um, that for myself as a second generation European settler whose paternal ancestors made their home, on the lands of the Acadia First Nation, and as a third generation settler from Europe whose maternal ancestors made their home on the lands of the Ardoch Algonquin First Nation, that the buildings and presence of the London Public Library System are located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, as well as the Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Lenapewak, and Attawandaron peoples. The Crown Treaties in this territory are known as the Upper Canada Land Surrenders. These treaties continue to be living treaties and this land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land. We invite you to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to reflect on acts of allyship with and actions to support Indigenous communities. The link to these calls to action is being shared in the chat. Acts to raise awareness and take personal action could also include reading books by Indigenous authors, a selection of which will be included in the follow-up email after this program, or by connecting with local Indigenous serving organizations. In light of our program today, I would also like to acknowledge that many Indigenous communities recognize Grandmother Moon, who watches over the waters of the earth and who governs the natural cycle of menstruation known as the moon time. It is said that the moon cycle is a time of great power, that it is a gift for those who menstruate and a time to cleanse mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Thank you for reflecting on these acknowledgements. I am happy to welcome our guests today, uh, to listen to them, to share, and to learn with all of you. Here is our brief agenda. We'll invite Danny Bartlett to share her thoughts, and then we'll hear from uh, Tasnia Rahman and Matthew Sereda. Our guests will then share their final thoughts before we hear from you in our question and answer period. I want to remind everyone to submit your questions in the chat box. Feel free to type your questions there at any time. It is our intention to offer a welcoming and inclusive environment for everyone. Please reflect on this as you share your thoughts and questions. Just gonna stop sharing the screen. Great. And now I will introduce our guests. Just gonna check here, good stuff. So Tasnia Rahman is, I'm just gonna catch up to myself, is a first year student at Western University pursuing uh, medical sciences. She was a student trustee for the Thames Valley School Board in the 2020-2021 school year. During her year as trustee, Tasnia advocated for sustaining and improving equity and accessibility. 
With menstrual equity as a focus, Tasnia mobilized the Student Advisory Council to survey students about their menstrual management experiences, worked with student stakeholders and board staff to take action on student input, and collaborated with the board's equity team to promote menstrual equity initiatives. Danny Bartlett is the Executive Director of Advocacy at the Gender Coalition of Ontario. She is co-chair for the London Coordinating Committee to End Women Abuse, a steering committee member on the Central Planning Table for the Local Employment, Employment Planning Council, a member of All Our Sisters Steering Committee, and she sits on both London and District and St. Thomas and District Labour Council. Advocacy is an important part of Danny's life from lobbying to direct actions to creating equitable policy, she believes in fighting for gender equality. Matthew Sereda is the Equity and Inclusive Education Learning Coordinator for the Thames Valley District School Board. Matthew is a recipient of an Atlosa Peace Award for his work towards Truth and Reconciliation and a Prime Minister's Award for Teaching Excellence for his work with the School Within a College program. A warm welcome to all of you. And so now I'm gonna welcome uh, Danny uh, to share her thoughts and I'm just gonna share the screen as well. Welcome, Danny. Thank you so much. Just get myself organized here. Perfect. Okay. So um, a day in the life of menstrual equity. Um, when I first started talking about uh, menstrual equity or I like to say menstrual justice, it seems so weird, but now, you know, 13 years later, here we are. Next slide, please. So Tampon Tuesday, the origin story. For me, my uh, work with menstrual justice uh, started with Mandy Fields um, back in 2010, but uh, Tampon Tuesday was created after Mandy had visited the food bank um, to find out that there was no menstrual products for folks that menstruated. And she said, well, what are people to do? And so. Jane at the food bank um, slowly um, talked about what that looked like and, and, and you know how women were choosing food um, and, and products and what that meant. So she started this event, this fun event at um, a local restaurant and five folks came out and brought products and the, most of the folks were related to Mandy. Um, but the next month when she did it, you know, 10 folks came and, and then she started having guest speakers. And it really, it was just about people getting together and, and, and talking about this need um, at the food bank and what happened. And so now we, here we are 13 years later, uh, Tampon Tuesday has brought products in from, you know, all over. It supports uh, folks in the food bank, you know, month after month after month. And it's such an amazing story. Um, and during that time, Irene Matheson started talking about how much she hated, uh, sorry, thank you, started talking about how much she hated that we had to pay taxes on these products. And so she took this fight on and, and you know, we met all over the place and started lobbying for it. And surprisingly, um, in July 1st, 2015, the taxes came off the product. It was a, quite a, a quick win in Ontario, which was shocking. But it, it, it was a win. And so now we don't see um, luxury taxes because that's what these taxes were. Luxury taxes are products that um, are so important to folks um, and so, so needed. Next slide, please. And then for me, I started talking to local folks that were living rough or, or you know, working in shelters and what it meant for them when they were menstruating and, and trying to get a, a feel for what was next when we do some activism and lobbying. And I heard stories from folks that were living on the street that were horrible and, and spoke to the lack of dignity, not having products meant. And so it was like heartbreaking to me, but it also talked about, um, started making me think about security and, and what it was for, for uh, folks that menstruated when they didn't have access to, you know, a washroom or clean bathrooms or products um, in a hole. So then we started lobbying about, you know, how do we get products to folks that need them? And not only that, about how we started talking to business owners and, and local restaurants and the city about access to washrooms, because it was, it's more than just, it, it's more, 
it's about sort of dignity and, and how that happens for folks that menstruate, but everybody. Um, and then, you know, when we look at what happened with COVID and the access to bathrooms were um, stopped so quickly, it really became, it highlights, um, you know, what we learned when we were talking to folks on the street. Next slide, please. So then um, I started working at United Way um, and United Way took over this um, Tampon Tuesday movement. We called it uh, Go With The Flow. And right across the country now, uh, labor uh, folks at United Way started talking to workplaces, our workplaces that participated in United Way events about the importance of it. Um, and what was different or weird for me was how many people were shocked that we wanted to talk about menstruation. Um, the products and the poverty that it creates. And it's just, it's weird to me because I, you know, Mandy's just so open. She was just started talking about it, but that people were like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Like here, just take the products and go. People didn't want to um, put boxes at the workplace. Oh, like they're like, we can't do that. And the stigma really started to pull out how much stigma there was around this conversation. But, you know, there's no real difference. Sorry. There's no real difference from being able to go to the bathroom and have toilet paper or, um, you know, access to water after than to have these products. Like the, it's still about dignity and, and being able to like go about your day. Next slide, please. Um, so where are we now locally? Um, you know, I won't take any, you know, excitement from Matthew and Tasniza, but the schools in the city are now talking about products being uh, where they need to be. And now we're starting to have different conversations, like conversations about what happens for folks that menstruate um, that don't present um, that way. And, and what's happening in shelter systems and some support systems, because right now in our city, um, Folks that menstruate can't access the men's mission because of perceived safety issues. And, uh, you know, folks that don't menstruate or are, you know, born of an origin that don't menstruate can't access women's shelters. And so there's a real sort of what's the next step when we talk about menstrual equity and what does that mean? I My question when I heard this at the first time is if it's not safe for a man who menstruates to access the men's mission. Is it safe for anybody? And what does that mean? And so it's a new conversation to have. And where else, what else started to happen is after we did these Tampon Tuesdays, especially when uh, United Way participated, we had truckloads and truckloads of product. We were finding the uh, social services in our community were overloaded and didn't need more. But then that real um, sort of strange realization came to me from somebody from Oneida. Um, and they said, we have no product and we are often not able to provide uh, products in our supports. Uh, and so we started having a conversation. And at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, we had a big drive and we had all this product, but nobody wanted it. People were worried about touch points. But at Oneida, they couldn't get product. Um, and then when the reservation shut down for COVID and people weren't coming out in and out, there was a real sort of desperation and need for product out there. And it just sort of is eye-opening to me. My my community borders that community. And I'm, I'm so privileged that I can just access product at a reasonable price, although I still think the product is way overpriced. But as a, at a reasonable price, where there it's such a sort of the price is even higher if they can even access the product. So there's still so much, um, there's still so much, it's not, it's still not equitable. And so we still have some work to do. Next slide, please. I think that might be it. Oh, now what's next? So um, understanding the ins and outs of menstrual equity, I think the big thing is still talking about stigma. Folks still don't want to talk about periods and menstruation and blood and all those things. They're like, oh, don't say it. But it's still happening. And folks still need access to these um, issues. For me um, and the Gender Equality Coalition, it's really about inviting collaborators to the table. What does it look like to understand where the, the lack of equity and, and where the fairness is? Um, falling apart and what we can do to then change those situations. So like I said, for folks that 
um, gender identity isn't the same, how they should be able to access services in a way that still brings safety and dignity. And, you know, our, our Indigenous neighbors and, and partners don't still don't have access in the same way. And it's shameful. It's shameful in a community as amazing and lovely as London that, you know, our neighbors are still having some access issues. So, um, you know, I, I hope people will donate products when they can, that they will advocate um, for products to be in any place that there's washrooms. And then we need to have the conversation that we need products in both accessible, both to in uh, both gendered bathrooms for, for some reasons that not everybody wants to, is comfortable talking about now, but it's important. So I love the idea of all, as you know, someday we will only have gender neutral bathrooms and folks will be able to do their business with dignity and peace, but we're not there yet. So pro product needs to be accessible for folks, sometimes folks that we don't think might need them. And then, <laughs> um, you know, talk about periods and advocate anywhere you can and get involved. And that's it for me. Thank you, Danny. That was really helpful to see that longer view in London and where we've come from and to really have that call to action. So now I will invite uh, Tasnia and Matthew to, um, I'll just turn the slide here, to uh, share their thoughts with us. Thank you for that, Joanna. So I'm uh, Matthew Sarita, pronouns he, him, and his, and I'm the Equity Learning Coordinator for Thames Valley. Very pleased to be here today with Tasnia Rahman, former student trustee for Thames Valley. Um, if it's okay, I'll just provide a bit of a, an overview of Thames Valley's menstrual equity initiative, um, but, there, but then very much want to turn it over to Tasnia to talk about um, the more important student perspective on all of this. And so uh, really humbled to be a part of this conversation today, um, especially as somebody that does not menstruate. Um, I, I think it's very important for those that do not menstruate um, to get involved in the conversation. What we always say in terms of any equity or social justice conversation is that it's exhausting for people to have to advocate for their own inclusion. And so what we need um, are those allied voices to step up and really help to amplify conversation. So I'm just thrilled to be a part of this with you folks. Um, what you see on this screen right now is just a bit of an overview of Thames Valley's work related to menstrual equity. Um, so we are thrilled to be able to say that we were the first school board in all of Ontario um, to provide free menstrual products to students in secondary schools. Um, similar to um, Danny, what Danny had to share, uh, our initiative was very much uh, directly led by Mandy Fields. I'm sure many folks in our community can talk about um, you know, being led by Mandy. She's an incredible ally to many of these conversations. Um, but we were very fortunate, fortunate to work with uh, Mandy Fields and Tampon Tuesday, as well as Rachel Edinger and uh, Here For Her and their menstrual equity campaign. So um, based off of uh, consultation with them, uh, we first launched our menstrual equity pilot project uh, at Clark Road Secondary School in the spring of 2018. Uh, as we were launching that um, pilot project, it, it expanded to all secondary schools in the fall of 2018. Um, but as we were launching that pilot project, we were also working with student trustee Sarah Chun at the time, uh, who was uh, working her magic with our school superintendents and board of trustees um, for a larger, greater, uh, a, a greater menstrual equity um, campaign. When we first launched our menstrual equity campaign, similar to Danny's thoughts on access to products, um, we intentionally placed products in our all gender uh, washrooms to begin, understanding um, that menstruation is not necessarily always tied to gender identity or gender expression. And so we very much wanted to protect the identity um, uh, and privacy of folks that menstruate and make sure that they could access products um, in, in safe and in sensitive ways. And so that was, uh, I think, a major highlight of our initiative. We also, as a, as a school board, um, very much focused our communication related to the initiative on student achievement and well being, understanding that students that don't have access to menstrual products um, simply go home. And so we very much wanted to provide menstrual equity. Um, as a student achievement and well-being strategy for, for students that menstruate. We're very pleased 
um, that in the fall of 2019, our menstrual equity uh, initiative was expanded to all elementary as well as secondary schools. Products uh, are now available in female identified washrooms and all gender washrooms. And just this past fall, um, uh, the Ministry of Education provided funding um, in partnership with Shoppers Drug Mart to all um, public uh, um, boards of education um, uh, to promote menstrual equity. And as part of, uh, as part of that menstrual equity funding, um, we also uh, have a focus on social justice education related to menstrual equity as well. And so we're very uh, excited to launch uh, a menstrual equity student symposium um, focusing on social justice men menstrual equity um, for students this spring. And you can go to the next slide. Um, but with that, before maybe we play the video. Heck, how's it going? Good. Sorry, I'm just going to fix that. Brutal, no problem. What about you? I'm really sorry to hear that. But go I'm just going to go back. Just well, gonna... Okay, that is the next slide then, the video. Uh, it should be a student voice slide. If you want to skip ahead and then maybe we'll go back to the video if we can. Sounds good. I might have to pause and then skip ahead. Got it. Okay, thanks. And then maybe one more. Seems like they're out of order for you, but it's okay. And then one more again. Are you able to skip one more, Joanna? There we go. So uh, really at this point, what I wanted to do was turn it over to Tasnia, uh, who's going to talk to us about the very important student voice um, connections with this work. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for um, Danny and Matthew for sharing those perspectives. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Tasnia Rahman. My pronouns are she, her, and I was a student trustee with Thames Valley last year, and I'm here to share the perspectives as a student and as a young person and the role, the, the role that people like me have played in this and the impact that it's had on us. So to continue on with the thread of the presentation, um, when doing such vital work for student well-being, student voice becomes absolutely crucial in the process because our insights and experiences help drive the systemic impact of such programs in the right direction. Um, when students are involved in the action taken for students, such initiatives grow very powerful. So to add some context of student voice from personal experience, part of the reason why this initiative has been so well received is because our input has been well regarded. Um, as will unfold in our discussion further, student trustee Sarah Chan began menstrual equity advocacy in 2018 at the board level with support from her fellow trustees and the momentum was kept alive by myself and my co-trustee Mahang Daliwal last year. While the initial, initial motion by Trustee Chun addressed the provision of products in secondary schools and in all gender washrooms, in 2020, we wanted to go a step further to see how we could sustain and improve the existing program. I was personally motivated to engage in this work because I have firsthand experiences in how something as common as periods can be extremely pervasive to education and create barriers for us in the learning environment. We collected data from our board student advisory council, which is comprised of student leaders across the high schools regarding the awareness and stigma around menstruation, accessibility of the products to non-female menstruators and accommodations involving um, the whole sphere. We wanted to also develop an understanding of menstrual disabilities and how students and young people deal with, deal with that, specifically in the learning environment. We expanded the survey and reached out to the larger student body through our social media platforms. And also we collaborated with the board's equity team, which is made up of um, Mr. Matthew Sarita and other wonderful individuals. And we wanted to share our findings with them. Um, at the end of our term, um, Mahak and my term, we left the board with three key recommendations. Number one, that more educational materials are disseminated to students at the intermediate and or high school freshman level so they're knowledgeable about the various aspects of menstruation with the rationale that normalizing discussion around menstruation will go a long way in terms of combating stigma. Number two was that menstrual products are available and accessible to all students who menstruate, regardless of their intersectional identity. And number three was that educators understand and treat menstrual disability 
studies with an empathetic lens. This would include, but is not limited to, encouraging students to reach out about their menstrual needs if it is interfering with their learning and accommodating students who struggle with their menstrual management, such as those who live with menstrual disabilities. So up next is a video that you will be watching that showcases our collaboration with the board's equity team last year, in which we promoted and celebrated the greater, greater access to menstrual products across elementary schools and for menstruators who may not identify as female. So Joanna, if you could please scroll back to the video, it's quite a few slides upstream. I don't think the audio is coming through. Joanna, you'll have to unmute me. Why not? What's that? Sorry? You just need to be unmuted, Joanna. Oh, right, right. Thanks, Danny. Sorry. I'll start it over again. Appreciate it. Hey, Mac, how's it going? Good. The end of the school year has been brutal, though. What about you? I'm really sorry to hear that, but girl, same goes for me. But why not? I got some uplifting news that may brighten your day and take our minds off of schoolwork. Actually, maybe you can help me share the news by adding on some details as well. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Because if it's about the latest equity initiative, I am so here for it. And let's get this party started. Let's get some drum roll going. Okay, Thames Valley is expanding its menstrual equity initiative to provide free period products in all elementary schools beginning next fall. Such an initiative has been in effect at all secondary schools since 2019, and now elementary students are going to have the same provisions. Also, the board is committed to provide menstrual products in all female as well as all gender washrooms. The goal of this initiative overall is to provide menstrual products in a location where students need it so that students won't have to compromise their dignity and their privacy to request products from central locations such as offices. In fact, this updated initiative would support all who menstruate, including transgender and non-binary students, in accessing products without having to navigate conversations that may feel uncomfortable or challenging. Yeah, 100%. Period poverty, inclusivity, and accessibility are all aspects this initiative aims to address. In light of the fact that London has the third highest rate of child poverty in the country and that menstrual management is a pervasive part of one's learning environment, it's absolutely imperative to dismantle barriers to good menstrual health. And that leads us to why TVDSB is executing this project. By making free menstrual products accessible to all students, the board is aiming to ensure student well-being and support learning in a safe and equitable space. Although periods do remain a stigmatized topic of conversation in our society, these actions lay the groundwork for better awareness around menstrual equity by sparking progressive dialogue and taking poverty out of the equation. We hope that these steps eventually guide us to a place where discussing periods and accessing products becomes normalized across the board. We hope this news made your day a little bit brighter and gave you something to celebrate, just like it did for us. I could not agree more. A huge thank you to the TVDSB equity team for actualizing this and all the students and staff who have advocated and continue to advocate for this cause. Stay safe and good luck for the remaining school year, everyone. So Tasnia, I'll go to the next slide. So I can speak to these, uh, Joanna. So just looking forward um, uh, at, at some of the current goals, and then I think our next slide will talk about where we hope the go uh, work goes from here. Um, but just to sort of summarize uh, some of the key points from the video, um, Thames Valley is to, uh, committed to providing free menstrual products uh, to all students that menstruate. Our goal is to remove barriers experienced by students that are menstruating by placing products uh, where, they, uh, um, where they are so that they can access them privately. 
um, very much focused on providing privacy for trans and non-binary students, promoting student achievement and well-being, and providing social justice uh, teaching related to menstrual equity for students. And so if we can go to the next slide. So we can just go quickly over these, but these are just a couple of the highlights over the years uh, related to our campaign rolling out. Uh, so very happy to work with the various organizations uh, as we focus on advocacy. We'll go to the next slide. I think Taz going to touch on this one, and there we go. Uh, so if we could go back one, yeah, there, <laughs> our future goals slide. There we go. Uh, so really our future goals related uh, to the initiative is moving beyond just providing products to students. Um, so we do very much want to focus on making sure that a variety of products are, are provided to students to support students from a variety of diverse backgrounds. We have received requests from students uh, to focus on environmental activism and how it relates uh, to menstrual equity. Um, we very much are um, focused on providing culturally responsive practices related to menstrual equity, understanding that not all uh, students um, are able to access the same products. And that goes hand in hand with this idea of providing social justice education and activism related to menstrual equity. And so Joanna, when you began talking about moon time teachings, um, that is a, a very central to uh, where we hope the work uh, goes from here. And so with that, I think we can open it up, Joanna, to the, to the rest of your agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tasnia and Matthew and Danny as well. So now what we're going to do is welcome all three of our guests back to share a few more thoughts in the next five minutes or so. Just some, some final thoughts before we get to our questions. And thank you for sharing the questions you've shared so far. Feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat whenever you're ready. But yeah, I'll invite all three guests back just to share some final thoughts. So, okay. I just want to say, uh, Tazina, I'm so impressed with the recommendations uh, made from your group. It just sort of, uh, you know, perfect, perfect for International Women's Day. Uh, it just goes to show that, you know, our country and world's in good hands with uh, folks like you um and it was just i just loved it um and i just wanted to add that you know if you read stuff on menstrual justice or uh menstrual equity in bc they like to talk about how oh there's free products in all their schools and how they were the first but really our times valley school board was way ahead of them um and with work like that it just goes to show the way ahead of them on a whole bunch of other curves so i just want to shout out i just hear from bc all the time talking about how they were the first but they weren't we were, um, and it just is so impressive. I'm really excited to see it. Thanks for that, Danny. Tasnia, did you have any words that you wanted to share? Um, I just have a couple of thoughts, but please feel free to go ahead. Um, you go, yep. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to say that um, kind of to wrap up my train of conversation, um, it, London and Thames Valley and um, these things have been so intertwined and progressive in terms of menstrual uh, management provisions is because I think um, active, act, um, activism has been very inspired through um, people such as Mandy Fields and on and on and on we have inspired each other and even at the student level it's not just people like myself obviously Sarah Chun started this um, and at the provincial level that the um, that the action taken by the ministry that Matthew was speaking to about providing free menstrual products across all public school boards, that was actually taken by the Student Trustees Coalition at the provincial level and at BC and whatnot. All of that um, really makes me feel inspired for the future ahead. And I hope we do eventually get to a point where the stigma is just gone. Um, and then menstrual justice is something that everybody's actively aware about and is actively spoken about and the poverty associated with menstrual equity is just not a thing anymore. Um, so in closing, just thank you so much once again for allowing me the opportunity to do this. And I was so inspired by the conversation so far. Thanks, Tazmia. I think the last thing, the only thing that I wanna say, Joanna, before we go to questions, um, is just also a big shout out to City of London. So to you and uh, to Kinga being on the call, 
Um, we also know that City of London is is a large leader in this conversation from a municipality and, and city perspective as well. And so I think the fact that City of London, because City of London's initiative um, was moving forward at a similar time as Thames Valley's, um, that the conversation was just very amplified in our community, um, which for folks that are maybe joining outside of this region, um, I would say that that was in, in hindsight, um, a very important aspect of our campaign campaign is that there was many voices united at the same time um, to provide to prioritize menstrual equity as more than just providing products in washrooms. It really was about social justice. Um, and so I would say that that message coming from City of London was very much appreciated uh, in our initiative as well. So thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks to all of our guests. Um, I see we have some questions coming in, so I'll start with the first one. Um, and Danny, I'll invite you to um, start the, the remarks uh, for this question. So the question is, what is the single biggest challenge facing our society for menstrual equity and menstrual justice? I would say um, like the accessibility and appropriateness of product. So it's pricey. Um, not every culture and person is going to be comfortable using a certain product. They're environmentally unfriendly. Uh, they're manufactured in a way that's hurting the environment. Plus, um, they're not really good for like humans. So I would say the products themselves, how unaccessible some of them are not dignified. I would say that it's like the product is maybe the biggest problem. Thanks, Danny. I'll invite um, Tasnia to share any thoughts on that too. Um, I feel like a broken record right now, but I, I believe that the biggest barrier, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, is this the mindset. Um, I believe that there is there exists a huge amount of stigma and we're not even at the place where like um, in elementary schools where many menstruators begin menstruating, um, the knowledge and the um, the, the freedom to have these conversations and navigate these in a very dignified manner that 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 kind of um, discourse is just not available um, and it starts from the bottom up and like as we grow older we kind of internal internalize these trains of thought and we just never get to a point where the stigma is removed thank you for that Tasnia and Matthew I'll invite you to answer that question as well the single biggest challenge facing our society for menstrual, men, menstrual equity, menstrual justice. Yeah, and I would just again like to center what Danny and Tasnia had to share on that. I think um, from my perspective as somebody that does not menstruate, um, I think it's very easy um, to be unaware of social justice necessities that are uh, experienced by many uh, in our communities. Um, if it's not our day-to-day -day reality. And so again, I think it's so significant that the theme for International Women's Day this year is, is this idea of break the bias. Um, we need all people to be a part of these conversations regardless of their identities. Um, because again, to sort of go back to the, the, the famous quote, but um, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so I think we very much have to hold that central to these conversations that regardless of our identities, abilities, or lived experiences, we all have a role to play in these important conversations. Thank you, Matthew. And we have some more questions coming in, so I'll read the next one. Uh, it's um, from someone who'd like to hear more about the future goal of addressing environmentalism and sustainability in the provision of products to students. And the question is, are there companies or are any companies uh, producing reusable products, supporting the initiative through donations and education? So any anyone wanna share their thoughts on that? I can just jump in from Thames Valley's perspective and, and really centering the feedback that we've received from students. And so similar to, I think what Danny shared just a couple of moments ago, um, that we the feedback that we've received related um, to products is um, uh, sort of the environmental unsustainability of the products in general. And so students really requesting environmentally friendly products. I, I see the the comment in the chat um, refers to reusable products. 
And, and so we are very much, I would say, in the early stages of, of looking at sort of uh, how we move forward with this. But I would say the largest piece of feedback that we continue to receive right now um, is re related to environmental activism. And so when we launched the initiative init uh, initially, we just, you know, we we're focused on getting products to students, but I think we're in a refinement phase of the initiative now. So can very much consider some of those uh, future goals. So I think it's a great question. Thanks, Matthew. Does anyone else want to share their thoughts on that one? I can quickly jump in. There's this company called Diva Cup. I believe they operate out of the United States. Um, they make menstrual cups that are um, very environmentally friendly. But I'd just like to highlight the fact that since it's taken a lot of effort and from educators, activists alike, all of that, and from the uh, from the policy level as well to get the pads and tampons into public places and schools now because lots of menstruators are more um, accustomed to use the, using these products, menstrual cups, these things are very much more environmentally sustainable, but many people just are not comfortable or are not um, well-versed in how to use these products. So even though there is a growing desire to make these environmentally sustainable, even from a student perspective, there's a push. Um, it, it, there are some underlying challenges that need to be addressed before I believe that can be done. And I completely agree with Matthew when he was saying that it, there needs to be much more refinement being done and much more planning because some of those challenges need to be navigated like that. Thank you, Tasnia. So Danny, go ahead. I would say um, I appreciate what Tasnia is saying, but I always like to push, um, always push the system. So yes, we should for sure, um, now that products are in places, they should be environmentally friendly. There's lots of reusable pads. There's um, women all over the world or organizations all over the world are making environmentally friendly um, products. And one of the reasons we don't have them now is because it's a huge money maker. So, you know, Playtex and those companies are making huge money on these plastic, um, you know, environmentally sound pieces. So what will um, allow us to get some entire environmentally friendly stuff is when the federal government moves that product is available in all of their locations, which is sort of like the next frontier where we're moving. Because once the government starts paying for um, these, the, the cost will be forced down. And when the part cost um, is forced down, companies will then want to say, oh, we're also environmentally friendly. So that it becomes the government's um, product of choice. So there, there's lots of ways um, to take sort of the capitalist greed out of these products, make them so that it doesn't matter what kind of product you want, you can get environmental options. Um, and then for sure, you know, when we talk about Diva Cups and those kind of things, they're not um, appropriate or like they're never going to be up to use for women that are living rough or, or who don't have homes. Um, because you need access to water. So like all of those other things have to come in. But I think now is the time that we start saying no more um, products that cause people, like so many women die from um, tampons. Like these things are all still part of the conversation. And so no more products that are killing the environment and killing women or killing folks that menstruate. And like hemp and there's all kinds of uh, bamboo, there's all kinds of products that would make great sustainable uh, material to make these products out of. Thank you, Danny. And could you just say a few more words when you mentioned um, issues around the endangerment of life for women or for people using tampons? Yeah, so there's, you know, the shock. Women can go into shock. People can die from the products, especially folks that um, aren't able to change the product as much. And there's also a whole bunch of cultural and religious reasons why the product's just not a, appropriate. Um, and so we have to move away from that. Um, and then talk about having products that is safe. The first um, pad that was ever created was created from a man um, in India whose daughter died because it, in his community, they had to go out to um, like shacks or, or they called them tents while they menstruated because they weren't allowed to be in town and uh, his daughter froze to get death. And so that's how pads came to be he said forget this i'm going to make it so other people don't lose their children thank you danny for sharing that story um i do have another question in the chat so i'll read it now 
what initiatives would you like to see on the horizon in London? And where would you like to see this movement go from here? Would it include uh, things like, uh, quote, period pantries in public areas? So just some thoughts on the future uh, in relation to access. I'll just let uh, whomever uh, jump in on this one. So I'll go. Um, we have uh, really some really great community centers in London. We're actually sort of, a, we keep saying how ahead of we are, but we are ahead. We have these community centers that um, product is available there in there. They have like food bank like um, pieces. So the product's available there. I would say in our community, it's easier to get product, not everywhere. I love the idea of community pantries. I love the idea of product getting everywhere. But one thing I think I would hope to see next for our community is talking about you know, this access to um, services when you're menstruating, shelter, beds, um, and then, you know, a push with the, in support of the federal government to get all of um, government buildings to have access. And and then, you know, we have to applaud the city of London because you can get them in like arenas and in libraries and in places and in, in I don't know about the libraries. I'm hoping the libraries, um, but we can get products. And so and then we'll push the libraries and, and push our, you know, corporate partners and, and, you know, local businesses so product becomes available. Thanks, Danny. And Matthew or Tasnia, would you like to add to that? Tasnia, did you want to jump in with anything? Uh, so the only thing that I would say uh, is to echo Danny is that we just need to keep pushing the conversation forward. Um, you know, I, I think uh, there's a large focus uh, from what I've heard related to menstrual products. There's a large focus in organizations pushing back related to cost or waste or people taking advantage of the initiative. But um, I can say from a Thames Valley perspective that it's just not the case. We don't see people abusing uh, the initiative. We don't see people taking more that they, than they need. Um, and so I would really sort of push back on some of those narratives and sort of really continue to ask the question, you know, um, if we view toilet paper and paper towel and washrooms as being a necess necessity, then why don't we consider these products as, as a necessity as well? I think at the end of the day, um, it comes down to providing human human dignity to people. Um, and so it's I'm so thrilled to see organizations like uh, City of London or Thames Valley or, or other organizations jumping on board. Um, but I agree with Danny that we, we need policy change so that th these products are provided everywhere. Um, they are not a luxury. Uh, it is about dignity and respect. Um, and so if we're providing uh, toilet paper and paper towels and washrooms, then we should be providing these products as well. Thank you, Matthew. Tasnia, did you want to add something? I'd just like to say I completely agree with what's been said so far. I don't have much to add other than, other than the fact that there is um, in other facets of our community as well. Um, for example, at Western, where I'm studying right now, um, I, I know that the Student Council has started an initiative that stocks free products um, at the building that's um, the University Student Council building, but it's not ha hasn't been expanded to other buildings yet, for example, just as a small example. So yes, I completely agree that we need to keep pushing so that it's, it's all widely accept accessible everywhere and nobody has to compromise their, uh, their privacy or anything like that to access some access products for something that is a bodily process and that happens regularly. Thank you for sharing that as well. And I think we have answered the questions that have come up in the chat. And we can take a few more minutes before I close out. And um, Danny, I'd like to invite you. Um, we had talked a bit maybe more about an international perspective on this issue. If you wanna just share for a few minutes um, some thoughts on that. Yeah, I just, it, it, you know, we've come so far where we are, but I just, there's so many folks now who still can't access education. They don't get to go to school when they're menstruating. Um, you know, it becomes a real equity issue when one week of every month, potentially girls aren't able to attend uh, school. The school doesn't stop to so the boys or, or um, you know, still moving ahead in education. And it's just, you know, sort of eye-opening that this is happening. Women are still um, not allowed to enter their, you know, churches or 
locations around the world when they're menstruating, um, for sure. Um, you know, the gender choice and equality there is not, it's just, it's just different. So, you know, we should celebrate where we're going, but know that this sort of menstrual justice piece around the world is, it's people are still dying. Uh, folks are still dying because of the menstruation. They're still not allowed to, you know, attend all of the things everybody else is. And, and then, you know, the access to product, even in this country, um, if you go up north to northern communities, they just can't access the product and they're making choices that are different and, and you know, don't offer the dignity that Matthew was talking to. And so we just need to look, I mean, we need to work in our own community, but we need to look outwards and, and you know, in northern communities here, but across the world and, and what's happening and how scary and awful it is. Thank you for sharing that, Danny. I appreciate the, that perspective. So with that, I will conclude the Q&A period. Thank you so much for all the questions and I'll welcome anyone who has questions later on or any other thoughts to um, just send me an email. You would have it in the confirmation, but we can put that in the chat for you as well. Um, also, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to the, the partners, like all the guests we have, of course, today. Um, but this series is a partnership between London Public Library and the City of London's Community Diversity and Inclusion Strategy. And I'll just welcome Kinga now. We introduced her, we said hi at the beginning, but Kinga, could you say a few words about the diversity and inclusion strategy for the City of London? Most definitely. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So the Community Diversity Inclusion Strategy is a community-led and city-supported initiative. Um, so it highlights a number of topics or a number of issues that are pre prevalent within our community um, that have been highlighted by community members as something that we should work on both, um, you know, as community organizations or community groups or the City of London. So as part of the work that they're doing, they wanted to host an initiative or a speaker series that brings um, broader attention to these issues and um, brings speakers throughout the community to provide their perspective and expertise. Um, so this is our first event and we're looking forward to the many more. Thanks so much, Kinga. Thanks for being part of it. So uh, Kinga mentioned our next event in April, we are looking at um, our session for the International Day of Pink. And this is a celebration of diversity and it's focused on awareness around homophobia, transphobia, transmisogyny and bullying. So the registration uh, link has not uh, available yet, is not available yet to share, but take a look for that and we'll be promoting that in the next few weeks. Or again, you can email me and I can share that information with you. The other last thing we'll do as we start to uh, wind down and send you back into your day, um, thanking you so much for spending this hour with us. Just gonna share a link in the chat as well where you can share your thoughts on the program itself, um, any thoughts you have uh, about the experience you had today and uh, thoughts about programs in the future to give us um, some idea of how we can offer programming that, um, that is what you are interested in. So the short survey is there, but I'll send it in the email as well as a follow-up for you to take a look at if you can't do it now. Again, there'll be resources from the library on this topic and on uh, some of the other topics I mentioned earlier. So with that, uh, I wanna thank everyone again. And what I'm gonna do is um, leave it to Danny, Matthew and Tasnia to share any last remarks before we say goodbye today. So we'll start with Danny. Oh, I well, just sort of happy International Women's Day, everyone. Um, I'll be in St. Thomas tonight at Railway City. Um, they're having their a Tampon TV Tuesday event, and all the product goes to the Y. So, thank you. I'll invite Tasnia now to just share her last thoughts. I've learned a lot today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and um, I've spent a wonderful time this hour. Uh, and I hope to continue to be an advocate for this cause as for as long as I'm able. And thank you so much to all the activists, the educators, the administrators, policymakers, everybody in the London community specifically and going outward that do work in, in this field and continue to inspire us and give us the means to continue on as well. Thank you very much. And I'll invite Matthew to share his thoughts. Thank you for that. I just wanted to say, first and foremost, a huge thank you to Tasnia and Danny. 
I learn something new every time I connect with you. So it was so wonderful to have your voices centered as part of this conversation today. Uh, and then also a, a huge thank you to London Public Library and City of London for inviting Thames Valley to share the success story with our menstrual equity initiative as part of International Women's Day. So thanks again. Wonderful. I'm just so glad we could share these stories. And thanks to everyone for your patience with my uh, inability to uh, forward slides today too. Uh, that was not great, but I appreciate you sticking with me and uh, for all of the great content shared here today. Let's keep the conversation going as we've invited everyone today. Let's talk about what you learned today with friends, family, and anyone you run across on the street today, uh, if you feel comfortable. But um, that's it for us. We will, as I say, post this video um, on the library's YouTube channel as soon as we have it captioned. So thank you again, everyone. Enjoy your day. Um, take good care out there. Bye.